Welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining us here today uh, for what I think is going to be a really important conversation about a critical area of the way we think about the health system in this country, one of the most important emblematic issues within it, of course, cancer care. Our event today is titled Cancer Care Fit for the Future. I'm Dr. Simon Kay, I'm the Director of Policy for the Reform Think Tank. I'm making sure to mention that I'm from the Reform Think Tank while at this conference, because people were reacting a bit weirdly to me before I started saying that. I don't know what they were. Um, some, some other organisation. But we will call that first, I assure you. Uh, Reform's a think tank of 20 years standing. One of the really important programmes that we're working on right now at Reform, it's about half of our time right now, is a programme called Reimagining Health. And right at the heart of our Reimagining Health program is the idea that there are some foundational assumptions and challenges within the way we think about the health system in this country that are worth rethinking, thinking fresh about. A new government, a potential new government, would be an opportunity to do that. And today's topic, the disease of cancer, how our ways of addressing, treating, and caring for those with cancer could change under a future Labour government, it's an extremely important one for any such effort to reimagine, to think again about the foundations of the health system. So cancer care, in my view, it's not only a massive challenge for our health system and a perfidious, dangerous disease, it's an extraordinarily personal aspect of health and how we respond to the health policy debate. I don't think there's any family anywhere in this country that has not had its story, its rush, its moment with cancer. And our health system's ability, or otherwise, to treat, to cure, <coughs> and care for those with cancer, it's more than just statistics, it's more than just numbers on a page, I think. I think it's emblematic of our relationships. I, I think our very personal relationship that many of us here, many of us in the audience today, feel they have with the National Health Service, with the way that health is managed in this country. So given all of that, it makes the context right now particularly troubling. Um, the UK's cancer care outcomes are continuing to fall behind those in comparable countries elsewhere in the world post-COVID. Wait times are climbing. There are fewer than 3% of NHS trusts right now that are able to meet the access targets, according to last year's statistics. More than 500,000 people are expected to be diagnosed with cancer each year by the year 2040. So it's hard to think of an issue within the health system that's of a higher salience and importance and impact for discussion. <coughs> and that means that a new vision for cancer care, modern, preventative, inclusive, perhaps human and empowering, but also one that's sustainable and makes sense within the system is needed. Now, I think our panel today is self-evidently going to be brilliantly positioned to explore and indeed perhaps to shape Labour's approach in an incoming government. West Streeting is, of course, the Shadow Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Marcella Turner is the founder and CEO of Can Survive UK. And Gemma Peters is the CEO of Macmillan Cancer Support. And this is actually a good moment to thank Macmillan for partnering with us and making today's event possible. And Wes, I think there's a strategically positioned Macmillan pin right in front of you there. I, I didn't put it there. I can only imagine that someone else did. But, but well, they gave me a mug when they came to see me. I'll put it on. <laughs> Uh, that's it, checks in the post. Uh, so that's more than enough from me. Uh, I'm the least interesting person sitting up here. I want to make lots of time for audience questions as well, if at all possible. So if I may, Wes, I'm going to hand straight over to you. Uh, well, thank you so much for um, being here. Thank you for hosting us. Um, I um, am always happy to do um, events with reform. In fact, um, uh, when we were debating the sort of the competing demands on the diary um, for conference, um, you know there were you know there was there was a comms and a policy um, uh, uh, advice I got on doing this event. The um, comms advice was, I want you sat in front of a big banner that says reform. <laughs> That's very much Labour's message. Um, 
Uh, comms can be that superficial sometimes. Um, and of course, there is a serious substantial point, which is the argument I've been making this week, just as only Nixon could go to China, um, only Labour can be trusted to reform the National Health Service. And they whisper it in Westminster. I think lots of Conservative MPs know that too. They're terrified of the NHS as an issue, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, and it's one of the many reasons the NHS and the difficulty it's in. And, and of course, from a policy perspective, um, you know, cancer is, um, as you said, highly salient. One in two of us um, will be um, get cancer at some point in our lives. So, I've, um, hopefully, um, take them on for the team in my household. Um, with my own experience with kidney cancer just um, a couple of years ago, which I'll talk about uh, briefly. Um, and um, Macmillan do an absolutely wonderful job. Um, so I'm delighted to see Reform partnering with Macmillan. Uh, I'll say a bit about that too um, in, a, in a moment. Um, I've tried really hard as Shadow Health and Care Secretary not to get pulled into um, specific condition specific um, uh, sort of topics or positioning all the time because there's a, there's a real danger in this job that you know you you're out there one week on diabetes, out there the next week on cancer, and then you're doing something on stroke, and everyone everyone knows you care about all the different conditions that people care about, but that doesn't necessarily build to a, um, a, a strategic picture about how you um, get the NHS's system back on its feet and make it fit for the future for every patient, whatever their circumstance, whatever their condition. The reason I'm always keen to talk about cancer, though, um, Yon, you know, is obviously very personal to me in my own experience, is I think it's the canary in the coal mine uh, when it comes to the NHS. And because of the focus it gets, because of the salience, and because um, in order to um, effectively tackle cancer, uh, you have to do all of the things that a great healthcare system is needed to do. When cancer care isn't going right, you know that the system um, as a whole isn't working. And that's, I'm afraid, where we, where we are. Um, when we were last in government, we had the lowest ever premature mortality rate for cancer, saving nearly 9,000 lives. The cancer guarantee meant that people would see a specialist within two weeks uh, if cancer was suspected and starting treatment within 18 weeks, and yet, we are in a situation today where people have been waiting longer for cancer care every single year since 2010. Cancer is more likely to be fatal for people in our country than all other comparable countries. We've had years when targets have been missed and we've seen a response this summer which was to water down some of those um, targets. <coughs> um, and so I think you know, my thinking about the sort of approach that's needed to cancer, I think sort of tells you um, not just what we need to do to improve survival rates from cancer, but that actually tells you what you need to do to fundamentally get the NHS back on its feet and fit for the future. Um, because effect, effect, effectively dealing with cancer requires earlier diagnosis, it requires faster access to treatment, um, it requires a focus in terms of life sciences to better understand cancer in order to improve treatment. And then there's a really game-changing stuff, which is around prevention, both in terms of um, you know, the way in which um, you know, so <coughs> the pushing the boundaries of science and innovation means that we will be able to predict and prevent cancer, to provide far more <coughs> precision medicine in a way that I think is potentially revolutionary and transformational. Um, and then more broadly, we know that there are you know, lots of social determinants um, that make cancer more likely, and um, our likelihood of experiencing cancer directly more likely. So in order to improve things on cancer, we will be improving um, things for everyone, because in order to build the future that we want to see, um, prevention, earlier detection and diagnosis, faster access to treatment, and world-leading outcomes 
we will inevitably create a rising tide that lifts all ships and improves the lives and experiences of patients with a really wide range of um, conditions. And that's the future we want to build. I want the Labour government to be judged on whether we improve cancer survival <coughs> rates. Um, in our mission-driven approach, we've committed to tackling the biggest killers and for cancer, we've committed to hitting all relevant cancer waiting time standards within the first term of government. That is hard. Uh, thanks, kid. Uh, uh, and it's crucial. And we're going to move heaven and earth to make sure that we do it. And I know from my own experience how vital early diagnosis is. Uh, my kidney cancer was caught in stage one. Uh, the NHS has saved my life. I'm cancer free and my prognosis is excellent. Uh, but it could have been so much more um, difficult had. Um, I not had kidney stones, which turns out, by the way, much more um, painful than the actual tumour. Um, but we have known I had the tumour <coughs> until potentially it was too late in metastasizing, and before I know, I've got a whole range of secondary cancers that could have even been, um, you know, life threatening. So that's why we've announced our Fit for the Future Fund to provide the money the NHS needs to double the number of CT and MRI scanners the NHS has. It's why on prevention. Um, tackling obesity and smoking is vital. We've committed to introducing a ban on junk food advertising pre-watershed, and that's going to be um, on digital platforms, not just in traditional broadcasting. And where Labour leads, um, Rishi Sunak follows. Um, <laughs> I know he's given Liz a free vote because um, the Conservative Party sadly dances to the tune of Nigel Farage's days, quite literally. Um, but the, the rare bit of good news I can offer Rishi Sunak is that when it comes to that free vote, Labour will be whipping we will be whipping in favour and we will deliver the votes he needs so that this generation of children grow up smoke free. In fact, even less likely to smoke than they are to vote Conservative. Um, and we will provide... Um, oh, it's a really generous applause, especially when you've heard that joke before as well. Um, <laughs> and we're committed to providing £1.1 billion to provide 2 million extra appointments for client care every year so that patients aren't waiting anxiously for cancer care. Um, but of course, this is so much bigger than, and wider in terms of the impact of cancer um, than, than simply um, the medical support that's needed. It's also about the care that we need, particularly um, when it comes to different types of cancer, different stages of our diagnosis, and the different conditions in which people experience cancer. You know, I always say, I, I, you know, when it comes to cancer, I was lucky, not just because. Um, my cancer was caught early and my treatment pathway was so much more straightforward. But I had a job where my pay wasn't docked when I was off receiving cancer care. I had a boss that not only supported me, but promoted me, um, despite knowing I was going to be off um, with cancer care and treatment. I didn't have to worry about how I was going to pay the bills. I wasn't in a cold home. Um, I had a partner at home who was able to um, cook me meals and, and make sure that, um, you know, in those moments where I felt lonely and down and, and in pain during my recovery, that I had that support there. Um, Macmillan's a brilliant organisation because um, you provide so much of that care um, and Macmillan nurses do a wonderful job. There aren't enough of them, which is why our workforce commitments are so important. Um, but partnering with um, the voluntary sector um, is really important, both in terms of the advocacy that you provide also the services that you provide to, and I, I'm really keen to underline the fact that we really want to work with the voluntary sector, not just in terms of voice and advocacy, but in the delivery of public services and the design of those public services too. So thanks very much for being here for this um, important conversation, looking forward to sharing ideas, um, and I hope you're reassured <coughs> that against what is a very, very challenging black backdrop, there is a, um, there's light at the end of the tunnel, um, there is a plan, that can get the NHS back on its feet for the future. We just need to get Britain to vote for it. Thank you so much, Wes. Very helpful uh, opening statement. Um, Marcella Turner. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you to Reform and Macmillan for inviting us to come to Spire to be here today. Um, I'm going to just go straight into my opening speech. Um, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer a few years before he died of the disease. My mother was diagnosed with bowel cancer a few days before she passed away. 
And it was during um, the time of caring for my father to the end of his life that I realised that there was, although there was fantastic services about, there was a lack of cultural appropriateness within those services. Not only did we have to deal with the emotions of, <coughs> of losing someone that we loved dearly, but we also had to navigate the health system, which at times was challenging and extremely frustrating. It, it, it appeared that no one was speaking to each other. So every time we called a department, we had to explain our story all over again. Um, after the death of both my parents, I founded Cancer Vibe UK. What does world-class cancer care look like, feel like, and sound like? Before I respond to this, let me share three examples of issues community members come to Cancer Vibe asking for our support. A 46-year-old woman diagnosed with, with breast cancer, she's informed that someone will be in touch. She's anxious, she's concerned, and of course, she's, she's thinking the worst. Three weeks go by and she hears nothing. She becomes even more anxious. The lady contacts Cancer Vibe asking if we can support her and to find out what's going on. She has a, she, sorry, she has a breast cancer specialist nurse who, who has not unfortunately been responding to her calls. She gives us the number, we call, we, we leave a message on our answer machine saying, please can explain the lady's situation, asking for someone to get in touch by the end of the day. By the end of the day, somebody has got in touch with the lady and a week later, she's in hospital receiving treatment. Apparently, she'd been overlooked. Her paperwork had gone missing. Second case, a 63-year-old man diagnosed with prostate cancer. From diagnosis to treatment, this man was kept fully informed. He received a timely treatment, which went well. It, it, could not, it, it could not fault the process up to that point. Where it fell short was there was no consistency in the aftercare. In his own words, he felt like he'd been on a conveyor belt and allowed to just fall off at the end. To just fall off in a emotional, psychological and physical heap with no one there to catch him. And finally, a family member came to see us seeking advice about their 80-year-old mother. After being in hospital receiving treatment for bowel cancer, she was, <coughs> she was discharged um, this in discomfort. She had been told that it was it was normal, and she didn't have anything to worry about. A week later, her mother was back in hospital with an infection. So those are just three examples of where it works up to a point, and then it doesn't. And these are real examples from community members who come to cancer by seeking our advice. So today, we are discussing cancer care fit for the future. For me, this means consistency, communication, listening, hearing, inclusion, equal access, effective partnership, and trust, transparency, and a, di and a diverse workforce. What does, what does future cancer care look like? Statutory, community, and charity organizations working together and sharing um, their knowledge, experience, and learning to support the improvement and delivery of cancer care and support services that are inclusive and equitable. What does it feel like? It feels like a cancer care and support pathway that is joined up, easy to access and navigate, culturally appropriate and reflects diversity in terms of the services available and its workforce. What does it sound like? It's open and honest communication with the service user voice being the most important of all. We only learn by listening and hearing, hearing those with lived experience, acting on their concerns and including them in the, in the design of future cancer care resources. These statistics <coughs> is, that, is that by 2040, 
500,000 people in the UK who have been diagnosed with cancer. Let's hope that the work is done now, sorry, let's hope that the work that we do now will contribute to the world-class cancer care that will be needed in 2040. World-class cancer care means putting patients first. Thank you. Currently, there are three and a half million people in the UK who have cancer, and in the next couple of years, that's going to rise to four million. Like it is absolutely the defining healthcare experience of the UK. So Wesley's right. Like if we can fix cancer, then we get to learn how it is that we fix the health system overall and for all um, going forward. So I really, really think that this is the place for us to focus. And to steal Wesley's words, it's absolutely currently the canary in the mine. So it was cancer organisations that first were flagging what was happening around cancer weights, around delays in diagnostics, around backlogs, around the mental health impact of these delays. That every single stat that you hear quoted is a person who is anxious and worried and not able to live their life and contribute to society in the way they would want to because all they can think about is whether or not their cancer treatment is going to happen on time or whether or not their diagnosis is cancer and what stage it, it is at. So I think the, that and the deep inequities that Marcel has talked about that we see that have existed forever in healthcare in the UK, we just need to be honest and open about that, and they have become exacerbated over the last few years. So the fact that we sit in a room with healthcare inequalities rising and widening as we go into this next period with potentially a new government is something that we need, really need to look hard at and think about how it is that we tackle it. And also, so not only is it the canary in the coal mine, cancer is also a beacon of hope for the health system, right? That like how excited are we about new technology that's coming through, new innovations in care pathways, new scientific discoveries that will bring cures to patients with cancer. It's an extraordinary time of hope. <coughs> and yet, if we cannot set up a system which is able to bring that innovation into the system in a way that everybody can access it fairly, then we will have failed. So we can get excited about what the innovations are, but we need to think about it, we think of a middle with three lenses in mind. So one is, is this innovation deliverable? And by that I mean, have we got a workforce that is skilled and able and with the right capacity to deliver what this innovation is? Because we can get excited about a new drug and nice can approve something that's through but actually if the impact of that is that a nurse specialist is going to have to spend three or four times as long with that patient than they would have done previously if it's going to put more pressure on our diagnostic capability <coughs> where we already are buckling under under stress then we haven't really understood what the true cost is of that approval so how do we think about in the round whether or not any new innovation coming through is that is actually deliverable and how do we put the things in place to make sure that what we know is coming down the track that is really exciting is deliverable. The second thing we talked about is equity. That's the second test for me. Like any innovation coming through, is it designed for the people that are least likely to benefit first, not afterwards as an afterthought when finally we get the data, and we don't always get the data, when finally we get the data to tell us that it isn't being experienced by everyone everywhere. So we need to start with who are the people that are most likely to miss out? Let's design what this innovation is. And then thirdly, it's about people. Like the health system is a people system. It is about putting right at the heart the people who are experiencing, receiving that treatment and that system. And that means thinking about the health system, I think, differently. So we think about the health system as the NHS. Like the NHS is absolutely the backbone of the health system, but it isn't the whole health system. So we know firsthand in Macmillan, when someone contacts us with cancer, 
people as the first thing to be what people to say to them is what matters to you right now? What do you need right now? It starts with the person. And often what people need right now is security, job security. They're concerned they haven't got anyone to look after their children. Maybe they're a carer who's looking after someone with dementia and they think they can't possibly start cancer treatment. Or maybe they're worried about telling their people in their family that they have cancer because of the impact it will have on them. And if we don't see that person right at the centre as a whole person who is way more than their cancer diagnosis and who has needs that go well beyond their cancer diagnosis, and then what we need to do is wrap our support around those people in order that they have the best possible experience of cancer. And I'm so pleased to hear Wes say, more than survival, it's way more than survival. You know, that breaking news, we're all going to die, and a lot of us are going to die with or of cancer. Like, that is going to happen. But the experience that we have is absolutely vital. It can be a good experience. We can have good deaths with cancer. We know how that works, but actually at the moment that isn't happening. And so that brings me, so the three tests, which I slightly spoke a bit too long about, so you might have lost three, are, um, is it deliverable? Is it equitable? Has it put humans, is it human-centered? Are people right at the heart of how we're gonna deliver it? And if we can answer those three tests, and I think we really will be capable of building something that's fit for the future. And another bit of optimism, <coughs> I've heard some examples today already, there are many, many more that will come up. <coughs> Actually, a lot of what is best about the health system in the UK exists already, it just doesn't exist everywhere. You know, so we've talked about like many, many examples of where we're able to deliver something. So I talk about a project that Macmillan's funding in Oxford around end of life work. So it's a social finance model, works exactly as I've just described, wrapping care around people in the last 12 months of life. And actually, we're able to save almost 13 bed days four blue light trips for A&E. People, that, that, that is cheaper than having 12 extra bed days and all those trips for A&E. And most importantly to me, people are where they want to be at the end of life, which is at home. And the sum total of that project is a net gain to the system financially. So there are things that we can do. The question is about how we get them adopted, which I think is really critical. And then finally, just to pick up what Marcel said, I think the answer to this is absolutely about collaboration. It's bringing the very best of the voluntary sector. It's bringing the very best of the health system to be, bringing the very <coughs> brightest policy minds and the commercial sector together to say, how is it we can work together to fix cancer? And if we can do that, we can fix the health system. I wish you were Thanks so much. One of the themes that I think is emerging here is Three of your comments, I don't know if you're going to agree with me, but it's about holism. It's about the whole system picture, the whole person, as you put it, Gemma, treating people like people. Regulations <coughs> are designed where policies are constructed. Thinking about the panoply of different relationships that lead to unequal outcomes because we don't encounter this disease in the same way, depending on our background and our demographic. And you also talked about a health system performing well against cancer would have to, by definition, be a health system that performs well in all these other ways. Is there a holistic picture for you here as well? Yeah, very much so. And, you know, the, um, it was, it's so funny listening to some of the things that both of you said. I sort of thought, gosh, has someone leaked my conference speech? Um, <laughs> and, 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 if, and if it has been, if you could just take another 300 words out of it, that would really <laughs> get me off the hook with Keir's office. Um, that's the stage I'm currently at. Uh, it was all wrapped up and finished, and uh, you know, eight ago, so it was really, really well organised. I'm sure they all the deadlines that were set. Um, uh, no, that's absolutely right, and you know, I, I, I hope that you know, so what people will leave this Labour conference with by the end of the week um, are <coughs> some very specific things that they know a Labour government would do, which would. Um, really make this tangible in terms of the reform agenda. So I think, you know, when we, talk, when we talk about the healthcare system overall and the sort of reform that's needed, especially those of us who are highly engaged in it, it can start to get really wonky um, and technocratic. And it's really important that we bring this to life for people in a way that I think both Marcella and Gemma did um, in talking about not just the, the 
the statistics and the challenges that were lives of the people that um, we're talking about. Um, so I hope people come away with, yes, a list of specific policies, but also a really clear sense of the approach that's needed and why reforming the National Health Service is absolutely essential if we are going to have an NHS there for us when we need it for the next 75 years. And that is built around um, an approach to health and social care that is about shifting from an excessive focus, some of us might say, on acute hospitals into primary care, community services, social care, um, really providing support to people where they are in the community, getting there faster, being there for them at home. Um, the second big shift is from a pretty analog NHS we have today to one that is more digitally driven and harnessing the enormous power of life sciences and medical technology where this country is a global leader in many respects, although that position as a global leader is under threat. And thirdly, a health service that's a, an approach to health that extends beyond the health service and the Department of Health to one that is really about prevention. And seeing people, you know, as you said, um, <coughs> in terms of their whole lives and the wide range of things that people worry about um, when they um, receive a life-changing diagnosis. Um, and, you know, the thing that has given me most hope, actually, the point Gemma <coughs> made right towards the end of her remarks, when people ask, can anyone do this? Which I'm getting a lot on the doorstep at the moment. Um, uh, you know, the big, the big opponent, the biggest opponent for the Labour Party in the next general election isn't the Conservative Party anymore. It, it's cynicism. I think people think things are so broken that they wonder if any of us are capable of fixing it. And what gives me hope, and ought to give people that reassurance, is that the future that Labour's describing and the reform agenda that we're laying out this week in Liverpool is based on the evidence and practice that already exists. There are already people showing us what the future looks like, how great health and care could be. The problem is, is that that outstanding performance is also exceptional performance. It is literally the exception. And we've got to make what is currently exceptional very ordinary. Um, and you know, you may have heard me say, um, you know, the NHS loves a good pilot, absolutely loves pilots, got more pilots than the RAF. Um, what the NHS is utterly terrible at is adoption and rollout, which when you think about it is bizarre. When we've got this single payer system, this national health service, not, you know, but when people sort of, you know, get under the bonnet, they realise how fragmented it is. So you don't have a system that says, actually, do you know what, what, what Andy Burnham's been doing? Greater Manchester around integration of social care uh, with health and looking at uh, community services and prevention. This is really groundbreaking stuff. Let's make that happen everywhere. Um, instead, you know, sort of Andy Burnham pops up and says, oh, some really interesting things people are doing here in Greater Manchester. And uh, people go, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Rather than, oh, how can we do that? Uh, let's, 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 let's get him in and, uh, and, and help us in <coughs> Liverpool City region. Um, you know, in, in you know, on Tains, you know, in, in sort of, you know, further afield in on Teesside and um, in Cumbria. Um, so ad adoption rollout is going to be absolutely key. Um, and I think by um, pointing people to the things that are already happening, the future that is already being built, it will not only uh, provide us with the credible plan I think we are building and setting out this week. Uh, it will also crucially provide people with hope that politics can be a force for good, and that we can have. National Health Service that fulfills its founding mission um, as a public service for it points of use there for us when we need it. You weren't kidding about only Nixon can go to China. Right? No, only, really. only Streeton can go to China. Well, I don't think I can at the moment, no, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I think um, it, it, really is, it really is a serious point. I mean, look, some of the things that I've said in the last um, 12 months in particular, um, you know, it's, it's normally considered heresy um, in terms of. You know, I've just been really blunt about the state of the NHS and how frankly awful it is in too many cases. Um, and the reason I've done that is not um, to because I've you know I've got some beef with the NHS and you know I can't stand it. It's quite the opposite. It literally saved my life. Um, 
going back to what Gemma was saying about a good death, you know, on Friday evening, my grandmother died. Um, after 10 years with us that we never imagined we would have, and when she received her terminal diagnosis um, just over a decade ago, but she's had 10 years of really great life extending cancer treatment at the Clatton Bridge um, here on Merseyside. Um, and towards the end, you know, she had brilliant district nursing, which meant she could be in the comfort of her own home with um, a husband who wanted to be there for her, um, holding her hand. My, my uncle and his wife providing, a, you know, a bit of support and a home too. Um, if I'm allowed to um, you know, say that's Marie Curie. Um, oh. not, not, I don't know, so sorry, Gemma. <laughs> competition, um, I don't know, it's not really like that. But Marie Curie providing hospice at home, um, providing free of respite, the St. Kentigern's hospice um, up, the, up, um, up the road from them, um, providing not just palliative um, care for my grandmother, but and, and arts and crafts that she really enjoyed, but um, actually family support for, particularly for my grandfather um, and for the wider family. And so when she died, um, she was comfortable and it was a completely different death that I've watched and um, saw on Friday when I went to visit um, compared to my other grandmother who you know, died 30 years ago, writhing in pain and agony in a hospice of, um, with, with lung cancer that was caught too late and where even back then if it had been caught early, um, our, our treatment pathway for lung cancer back then was terrible, um, even at stage one and stage two. So we can see how things have changed. We can see that even against this very bleak backdrop, there are some really great examples of outstanding care. I'm an example, and I'm grateful. My grandmother, um, uh, you know, late grandmother, <coughs> is an example, and we are grateful. Um, but we also see um, where the NHS fails, and I, the reason I'm so robust in challenging that failure is because I want the public patients most importantly also the staff working in the NHS to know and we have noticed because the thing that I another thing I've taken great heart from in the reform conversation is that it's my <coughs> staff in the NHS that are telling me keep going you know don't don't give up on the reform argument you know, take on some of the vested interests and take on some of the rose tinted sentimentality because they're the people that are seeing the failure and suffering the moral injury when they go home thinking I've bust my guts, slogged my guts out today, and did my very best for patients, and yet my best isn't good enough. The fact is beyond my controls. I'm working in a broken system that's wired in the wrong way, and is working against me, working for my patients. So I think, you know, it's the paradox about the NHS. Um, it has never been in a worse state. The public love for it is as great as it has ever been. Um, we love the NHS, we believe in the NHS, and it's because we love, in the, we love the NHS and believe in the NHS that we know the NHS needs to reform. Um, otherwise, we're not going to have it. And that's why um, Labour is leading the charge on the reform argument. We've got a serious plan, I think, to turn the broad consensus of reform into practical change. And now we just need the democratic mandate to deliver it. Thanks, Wes. Um, Marcella, we've heard very clearly there that appetite for reform. Some of the work I do with community research, localism tells me, I wonder if it's the same from your perspective, that big institutions government, <coughs> the NHS, are sometimes the worst at engaging with the full diversity of the populations in this country. So what could reform look like that helps that engagement will work better? I think that what could look like, as we've mentioned before, is that partnership um, between the statutory and voluntary community organisations um, because we work with, with communities, we understand our communities, community organisations, they're doing the grassroots level work, they know their communities, how are they tick, um, how to engage with them and so um, effective, um, effective change has to include effective partnerships across the board with the voluntary Can I just pick up something quickly? Because so one thing I was struck by Marcella in terms of the support that you provide patients, which I think was brilliant but also blood boiling, is um, why, why should it take um, your service to pick up the phone to get a patient hearing? It, it, it shouldn't. shouldn't. It 
shouldn't, but we have we have many cases of patients being being left behind, being lumped, being forgotten. Um, and again, it isn't. It's not bashing the NHS. The NHS is, is an absolute wonderful institution. When they get it right, they get it right. But unfortunately, when they get it wrong, they, they, they get it incredibly wrong. And um, we always find that when we get involved, all of a sudden things start start to move. And it's about that third party. It's about being accountable to a third party, and that third party is an organisation rather than an individual and that's the thing I totally agree with Gemma in that um, it's about seeing that individual person as a person yeah. and sometimes um, they're seen with a cancer person and not as a person and um, it's that approach it's, it's <coughs> a person-centered approach that is needed and I understand that the NHS have got in turn and they have challenges and strains etc but when someone is diagnosed with as most of you know, and as this as yourself as knows, I mean from my both my parents, it is the most challenging time of your life because you're imagining all sorts. And so when you are expecting that care from the organization that's supposed to <coughs> supposed to provide that care and it's not <coughs> where do you go to? Um, and you know, there are many people in the community who don't, who just sit there and wait, and they don't do anything. And meanwhile, their, um, their cancer diagnosis is getting worse. And then by the time they get seen, it's it's at the terminal stage, and I've seen it happen. So, um, No, 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 not at all. No, I'm just thinking that this is where I think though the NHS's problems aren't just systemic, they're cultural. Yes. Um, because I think there is sometimes, you know, too often a professional bias in the NHS. A professional picks up the phone from your organisation to be a patient advocate, um, and, and you know they're treated differently from the patient themselves. And I just think that's that's fundamentally wrong. Um, and you know we've got to change a culture that um, you know sees that basically some patients. And I do think um, there is there is cultural bias. We talked about the importance of a culturally appropriate service class bias sometimes where you know if you're um, you know sharp elbow middle class you'll get better service than um, people who uh, don't think you can or even should be pushy um, you know one of the best bits of advice I got in the early stages of my diagnosis journey was um, keep chasing you've got to pick up the phone you've got to stay on top of this you've got to keep phoning but there'd be lots of people who would say oh hang on a minute no the doctor knows best um, or, or perhaps, oh, well, no, that would be wrong. I don't want to queue jump. I just got to wait my turn. And meanwhile, there are other people with sharp elbows pushing through. But so that's why I think you know, it comes back to some of the stuff we were um, saying recently around Martha's rule. Um, you know, we've not just got to get the NHS off its knees. We've got to get patients off their knees as well, and have patients with more power and more voice and more agency. Uh, and an NHS that respects patients, all patients, whatever their background, and also respects the other thing I was really shocked by <coughs> earlier as well. Um, you know, patients as experts by experience. Um, you know, on lots of things, the doctor does know best. That's why they went to medical school and we don't. And why, when I was given a choice about, you know, I found it quite funny. You know, my surgeon, who's a really world leading cancer surgeon, said, We've well, got a number of different options. You have a partial nephrectomy, a full nephrectomy. And I was thinking, You're the one who went to medical school. <laughs> you tell me. But of course, there are lots of other things where we are experts by experience. And where I don't think the NHS always treats patients with the respect that we deserve, and particularly um, patients from. Um, backgrounds that are underrepresented in terms of the workforce of the NHS in the highest paid, highest value jobs. Gemma, let me pick that up with both of you. Yeah. Going to the audience, I've never seen an audience champion the bit so visibly <laughs> into our session, so let's try and get some of those in there. Gemma, let's pick up that, those connections out from the institution. So clearly important, the cultural biases that are pointed to this right? What's the Macmillan perspective on that? Have you experienced those biases? Have they changed over time? Yeah, and thank you for bringing in that 
because I think it's really important. So it used to be the case basically cancer treatment was chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery, but pretty straightforward, and lots and lots of patients were on the same cohort with the same experience. So for organisations who are in the space of advocating for educating, with help supporting, it's relatively straightforward. Actually, in the, in the very exciting environment we are now in cancer, where people's pathways look really different, more than half of people with cancer won't even have chemotherapy now. Um, but what it means is individual pathways are way more complex, and the decisions that people are being asked to make, make are way more complicated, and anyone would struggle. And then imagine if you're in a situation where maybe English isn't your first language and you're trying to navigate that, and all that you've got, you know, you're really worried about other stuff that's going on in your life, and then you've got things this big to read. And then imagine that where you've got your clinical nurse specialist who everybody knows is the linchpin in your care, who is themselves on their knees and who wants to spend time with you but simply does not have that time to spend. Mm -hmm. So we know that inequity is rising and my fear is that it will continue to rise because as Wes says, sharp elbows middle classes will find a way to navigate that and speak to their to doctors and they'll work out how it is that they fight for themselves and they'll talk to them a minute and then they'll get all the support around them to make sure they get the very best of what's available in the UK and we will then continue to see this gap rising of the people that are unable to navigate that. We can see it in things like clinical trials data. It's not equal who is being offered access to the system where people are being diagnosed. We don't understand why some of these things are happening and therefore we're not working hard enough to fix them. So the Macmillan perspective on this is that it all comes back to the person. That if you can have proper conversations with people about what they need and give them time to articulate that in the right setting, which isn't always a hospital, very often the community setting is a much better place to have those conversations. And then you can bring the very best of what's available in the health system to the person, not expecting them to show up at the front door where you, it's not good enough to say, we've got this service, it's here, you should come to it. Mm -hmm. Service has to be able to the community. And then we're able to give what is the very best that's available <coughs> to everybody fairly. The fair outcome of use, not just free of use, yeah. is what we need. Yeah. Really helpful, really interesting. We're going to go straight to the audience. Uh, now, I'm just going to say this at the top. We've got about 15 minutes by my clock, and so let's keep the questions quite short and then we can get through more of it. Um, so, yes, a lady here with a blue uh, sweatshirt. If you do have a roaming mic, just give it a second for India to get to there. Hi, Laura Donnelly from the Daily Telegraph. Um, you said you'll come down like a ton of bricks on vaping if the government doesn't go far enough, but I don't think the government have really set out what restrictions they're going to bring in. Uh, and I don't think Labour has either. I just wonder, could you be specific? Uh, would you would you want to see a ban on disposable vapes? Would you see, want to see a ban on you know uh, uh, on uh, different flavours of vapes and all flavours of vapes? And um, there's been sort of lots of language about tightening of restrictions and um, fines and so forth. But I just wondered, what would you do? Do you think that might go further uh, than what the Tories are, are contemplating? No, 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 let's take, let's take a few, okay. as many people uh, as possible. Yes, okay, gentlemen here in the front with the red sign. Uh, Richard Evans from Our Future Health, the UK's largest ever health research program. There's been some talk around the excitement around research, and I just wonder if you if you could talk about what you think the role of genomics linked with uh, with the use, of, use of big data can be in, in delivering the excellent cancer services we all want. Thank you. Uh, and I have someone here in the front in the black. Hi there, I'm Steph. I'm from um, the branch in the charity. Um, you've talked a bit about early diagnosis and catching cancers in stage one and stage two, but there are cancers that are not stage, such as brain cancers and also some other blood cancers. And I just wondered whether Labour would be willing to sit down with brain and blood cancers to talk a bit about how we can make sure that brain and blood cancers are included in those early diagnosis interventions. Yes. Hi, um, I'm a consultant oncologist, um, and my question is, I, I know that more capacity is needed within the NHS to get rid of the backlog. Um, you know, what, what are Labour going to do to um, free up uh, medical practitioners, CNSs, doctors from admin work, um, that because of the way that the system is crumbling, because we're, we're already doing about 30% extra work for free. So where is that capacity going to come from? 
Okay, that's a good starting range. Um, so we've got um, questions on policy around uh, cracking down on vaping, um, the use of new innovations like genomics research, big data, and uh, how we're going to free up medics to help address the massive backlogs in the current place. Wes, do you want to come in on some of that? Yeah, so, and I'll be just as punchy as quickly as, as, as I possibly can. Um, look, this is where um, you know we, we need to get um, people to be working at the top of their licenses and uh, the top of their capability, and it is a total waste of brain power and training to have you know nurses, allied health professionals, doctors doing things that, frankly, any of us who haven't been through their training could do um, for them. Better still. Um, in terms of um, te you know technology, um, you know we'll come on to the really exciting game-changing stuff first. But first of all, let's talk about the use of the stuff from my perspective in terms of pledge card and manifesto. You know what do we want? Better back office. When do we want it as soon as practically possible? The truth is, it's 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 not it's not the thing that's going to get the um, the heart running a bit faster and people rushing to the polling stations. But giving people um, you know basic IT infrastructure that can um, automate um, appointment booking and automate lists and automate a whole load of other tedious admin um, to free up um, staff time is exactly um, the sort of um, technology um, you know, digitally enabled NHS we need. Um, my sense is from talking to frontline staff, they're just grateful at the moment if they, if they turn up and the, and the monitor comes on. Um, or if the screen doesn't freeze when they've got multiple applications open to deal with the same patient because the systems don't talk to each other effectively. So, um, excellent, excellent question. Um, uh, when, we, when it comes to, to, to productivity in the NHS, the problem isn't um, staff work ethic and staff productivity, it's system productivity. And the biggest advocates for change on that staff. Um, on genomics, this is really, really exciting stuff. Um, I, and I just think you mean. <coughs> Describe perfectly the sort of core ingredients that will enable us not just to do faster diagnosis and faster access to treatment, but um, prediction and prevention of illness in the first place. So precision medicine, but also pre precision prevention. This is the game-changing agenda. We need Britain to be at the forefront of it, and I'm very excited to be working with Peter Kahn as our new Shadow Science Innovation Technology Secretary um, to how we how we drive that reform agenda. Finally, Laura, look um, on vaping. Um, uh, I won't take up time describing how angry I am, so I think I've got you know, plenty of quotes out there on that. But in terms of the solutions on vaping, and what I mean when I say we will come down on the vaping industry like a ton of bricks unless it gets its act together, um, what the vaping industry will say is you should fine people who are selling vapes to underage children, you should come down on them like a ton of bricks, and we can, we will, we want the government to do that. We, we are looking at things like harsher fines and tougher penalties, and even whether we should license the ability to sell vapes in the first place, whether people can be trusted to sell these products. Um, I'd rather not impose the heavy hand of, of state regulation um, on this, but um, I think there is an issue about the selling of vapes to children. But this is where my challenge goes to the vaping industry itself. It's not just about the sale, it's about the marketing. It's about the packaging. It's about the marketing and it's about the flavors. You are not telling me that cotton candy ice is a flavor that's marketed to adults to help them stop smoking. I think these are flavors, these are packaging, um, and this is a, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the point of sale drive, which is geared towards kids. Um, and I think, it, I think that's what they've done. This industry is addicted to a generation of children to um, nicotine who otherwise would not have um, started smoking, and I think it's a disgrace. I think the industry needs to get its house in order, um, or we will get the, the house in order um, for them. Um, so we, we you know we do want to see the, the ban on flavours, and as for <laughs> single use vapes, um, uh, you know I, I want to see them gone altogether. Um, I think they are absolutely terrible in terms of the environmental impact, um, um, and we've got to tackle the throwaway culture, not create more products that. We end up seeing litter in our streets and adding to, um, you know, adding to, adding to the challenge we already put onto the environment. Thank you, Wes. Um, Marcelo and Gemma, want to come in on e any of those questions? You're very welcome. And I'll leave vaping to Wes. I might just put briefly put the other two things away. Um, so Richard and our future health. Like I think one of the things that's really exciting about our future health and projects like it is their real commitment to 
looking at equitable data sets, so to be a five million person data set that has at its heart re being representative of the whole of the UK, which allows us potentially to understand some really important issues that we don't currently understand. Um, and one of the things that we're keen to be working with you on and others is really making sure that as things come out of that research that patients are equipped to really understand what it means. So if you, are, if you know that you've got a risk of something, but you haven't yet got it, how do we support people to understand what that might be? Because you know, there's risk that we turn huge swathes of the population into patients before they're actually patients. And how is it that we think about supporting people in that context is really, really important. Um, in terms of technology and work, so we hear all the time from Macmillan professionals, people who have to log into seven or eight different systems in the course of one of their clinical sessions, wasting so much time. Um, and I think it's a massive, it's, it's a massive issue. And, and actually thinking differently about how we have people doing the right tasks at the right time is, is critical. And not least where we can learn from good practice elsewhere. So we see in kind of half of NHS trust around the country, we've got really, in some cases, excellent care navigation posts in place where people are working with patients and the clinical team to get the right support around people at the right time. 25% of NHS trust don't have a single one. Another one, it just just got 20 of those posts, which making a really big difference. Like we could train a thousand care navigators in the next six months and get them into the system, and that would make a massive difference now for people with cancer, and we're not doing it. So I think there are, it's the whole point, there are absolutely things that we can be doing that takes the pressure off people now, as well as being really excited about the future of the prevention agenda. Let's not forget the almost four million people in the UK have got going through this treatment right now. So yeah, I just want to um, just make a point on um, the work that's going on around genomics. Um, it's really important that research communities do what they need to be had. Um, we actually worked, because I've worked with um, Chance England about four or five years ago, um, to, to actually address that issue. And um, so it's, there's loads of exciting things going on in terms of genomics, personalised care, and it's so important that the community <coughs> and other minority ethnic communities do not get left behind it. Yes. Because if they do, then when maybe patient treatment moves on, then those communities will be included and they will be involved with it as well. And very often there's a data bias that yes. we think is really important to address. All right, I make it three minutes on the clock. Let's cram in two quick questions. Uh, gentleman with the red lanyard just here. I, uh, where's condolences for your recent loss, by the way. Um, my name is Paul Bowden, Cabinet Member for Health and Health Social Care in the London Borough Revolution. Um, I was diagnosed with leukaemia and saved under the Labour government. My mother was diagnosed with lung cancer and died within a week under a Conservative government. What can we do, and I love the NHS, what can we do to stop this Labour building up our health care, the NHS and our health care system, and then the Tories turn it, uh, turning it down? Brilliant. And uh, there's a lady right at the back in here in white standing up. Hi, Wes. I'm Emily <coughs> Curie. As you know, we're launching our manifesto for palliative and end of life care with other charities at, at this conference. Um, just a, a short distance away from here, there's a 24 7 single point of access hub for people with palliative care needs where they can ring a phone number and get connected to the specialist and generalist services that they need when they're dying at home. It's delivering massive impact on the system, reducing the number of a &E admissions, ambulance conveyancing, hospital bed days. I wonder if we might be able to persuade Labour to commit to have one of those in every part of the country um, so that people can get the care and support they need and we can achieve better value for money as well. The uh, Marie Curie Macmillan uh, psychodrama continues. <laughs> <laughs> can I just say we collaborate very well with <laughs> I'm a big fan. That's not what you said to me last week. <laughs> Disturbed. Um, uh, look, uh, first, I'm really excited to see your end of life manifesto. I'm really keen to look at it. Um, while, while I would, uh, while, while I will resist the temptation to make an unfunded spending commitment, um, lest uh, Darren Jones apparate in front of us and, <laughs> and fire me on the spot. Um, uh, what, what I would love to see um, is the data, um, and, and let's put some numbers on the cost saving. Um, because while I've not um, yet succeeded in persuading Darren and Rachel that all of my investment safe proposals are, are, are kosher, um, uh, what, we, what we do need to do is spend the existing NHS budget we have more effectively and so where we can find cost-effective ways and, and not just cost-neutral but cost-saving ways of, 
uh, re re redesigning services to save money and deliver better outcomes. That's really what we're in the market for, and um, when public money is so tight and um, you know we can't spend our way out of the NHS crisis, we have to reform. Um, and Paul, uh, I mean, of course, the short answer is Labour's got to stop losing elections and, get, and start winning general elections. Do so consistently, of course. Um, I think there's a serious point here, um, which is. Um, I think only Labour can be trusted to reform the NHS. I think the Conservatives know that in their hearts too. What I would like to do is build a consensus about the future of the National Health Service that every party is able to sign up to. And my anxiety about what we saw at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester last week is that a Conservative Party that literally dances to the tune of Nigel Farage is not one that I have confidence in to maintain the post-war consensus about what the National Health Service ought to be and the principles upon which it should be founded. So um, let us hope um, that um, as the Labour Party um, dealt with extremists within its own ranks and has kicked them out, that the Tories stop applauding theirs and um, the centre-right of the Conservative Party um, use their time in opposition to, um, to to rebuild mainstream politics because I, I want politics in this country to be a real battle of ideas between people from different ideological traditions but a shared desire to make our country better so when people go to the polls they don't think who's the least worst option they feel like they've got a real choice um, and I think it'd be nice to have a period in our politics where both our main political parties were grounded in the mainstream. The Labour Party sorted ourselves out, I think people can see that. The Conservative Party seems to have looked at some of our recent history and thought, oh, well, that'll be piece of that, that'll be exciting. <laughs> um, I hope in time that, um, that mainstream politics um, that I'm trying to <coughs> uh, the extremes. Um, but in the meantime, I've got enough to worry about now. So the Tories can sort themselves out. Um, in the meantime, I'll sort out their mess uh, and build an NHS that's on its feet and fit for the future. By applause, it's, uh, it's fantastic. I think we're fresh out of time, everyone. It's been a fantastic session. I want to thank our fantastic panelists and thank the audience here for joining us today. And of course, thank you, Macmillan, for making this conversation possible today. <coughs> uh, it's personally, very, very important. So, one more time for our fantastic panel.